Samson, I give you a lot of I am from fire, but what Samson, I give you a lot of fumble. They see you say you wake up for some for the bread. You say you wake and never come for the bread.
Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> we, we are starting straight away by calling on uh, Pastor Bayo, the resident pastor of Klosak, to take us through the opening prayer. Shall we please rise to our feet as we open this program? Our Father, we want to thank you for the gift of life and preservation. We commit this program into your hands. We're asking that you engrace this program from the start to its finish. And we declare that this program will be a success in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, take preeminence and have your way. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Please, you may take your seat. Thank you, Pastor. We have a few of our dignitaries among us, and we will introduce them. We will introduce them as and when the others arrive. We have uh, Honorable Deputy Minister for Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations, Papa. Honorable Reku Brobe. We also have among us, I don't have any particular order, pardon me, the head of the civil service, Dr. Ivan Sagri, is among us. We have among us chief directors. They will appropriately be introduced, but there is one who is director of uh, Minister of Defense, Dr. Evans Jikum. We also have among us Mr. Daniel Salome of CDD. Thank you. The guest speaker will be introduced accordingly. And we have among us Madam Irene Jacobs, Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association. We have directors, heads of department and chief directors among us appropriately we shall be introduced to. Thank you very much. Yeah, I will now call on the executive secretary Isaac Bampo Ado to welcome all of us to this August event. Fine, please. Fine, please. Sorry. I think KK, you didn't recognize the CPP General Secretary, Mr. Pari Ado. Wave, wave your hand. Are you? Okay. God the Holy Spirit, Bleu B, Justice Dochi, <laughs> Honorable Deputy Minister, my own good friend, Papa. I call him Papa. Bright Roku Brobi, our own head of service, the general secretary of the CPP, president of CLOSAC, Mr. Ivan, Dr. Ivan Jikum, past president of CLOSAC and chief director for defense. All chief directors around and directors, colleagues, civil servants, executives of CLOSAC, all protocol observed. I have the singular honor to welcome all of you to the Sith Nathan Anankwa Annual Lecture and Excellence Awards. On behalf of the National Executive Council and the National Executive Committee, I find it refreshing always when I remind myself of the profound statement by the eminent civil servant it's an anankwa of blessed memory to the effect that it is the perfection of the civil servant that will move 
this country forward and not a politician. A bright laugh. <laughs> It is the perfection of the civil servant that has motivated the civil and local government staff association in Ghana closer to call for measures that would promote professionalism, integrity, and collaboration in the civil service and the local government service. These services have been long hallowed institutions whose utility lies entirely in their presumed anonymity, neutrality, and permanence from one political administration to the next. The civil service and the local government service are expected to remain in place, functioning in a professional manner to ensure continuity and process integrity in the administration of the day-to-day -day governance. The impairment of the activities of the civil service and the local government service would affect the development of the country and turn the tide of progress and positive change. It is within this context that the canker of the use of the Presidential Office Act 1993, thus is distressing at the effectiveness of the civil service and the local government services, has been brought to the fore to serve as the team for the Sith Letan Ananqua Annual Lecture and Excellence Award. By paying attention to our guest speaker in a lecture on the constitutionality of the Presidential Office Act 1993 and contributions from other dignitaries, I'm certain that we will be equipped with tools to call for an amendment of the Act or its abrogation. The Presidential Office Act has impeded the growth and progress of the civil service and the local government service. The Act in its current form is a duplication of the functions of the civil service. Once again, you are welcome to this ceremony. I hope that you all have an exciting moment thereafter. Thank you very much, and God bless you. You are one, you are welcome. <laughs>
Mr. Gobson of Gobsa. Yeah. We also have among us Madam Eunice Ose, Chief Director of Office of the Head of Civil Service. Madam. Indefatigable, eh? Yao, Dr. Yao Ba. SG, TUC, you are welcome. We also have among us a very strong and powerful guy, Mr. Benjamin Otu, President Klosak. We have among us immediate past Vice President of Klosak, Mrs. Rodaline Mensa Amwaku Mamaru. Klosak, Executive Committee members are here. Please, can you show your hands and then we wait for you. Give it to them, give it to them. Thank you very much. I will now hand over to the appropriate MC. I was holding the fort for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So at this time, um, we want to officially welcome you once again um, to the seat Nathan Annan Kwao Annual Lecture here at um, Klosak. And we want to remind you that we are live on TV, on Clock TV. So those of you watching us at home, you are live and then on our social media platforms. In the house, we have the Klosak Band. It's one of the bands we have here in Ghana. A round of applause for our great men here. Oh, you can do better than that. So in case um, you are here, you have any function, you have any activity, you need Klosak Band after we are done with this program. You can just see the band leader. So at this time, I will invite Klosak Band to give us a, a very nice tune, something that we can sit in our chair and tap our feet and shake our bodies more. So Klosak Band, over to you. A round of applause for Klosak Band. Yeah, we're we'll giving you something, something cold without me seated. Something seated. Ah, citrus, some green. Red roses, too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself. What a wonderful world Yeah I see skies of blue The clouds of what The bright blessed day The dark serpent And I think to myself What a wonderful world yeah. The colors of the rainbow So pretty in the skies I was on the faces of people going by I see friends shaking hands Saying, how do you do? They really say, I love you Babies cry Oh, watch them grow They will learn much more Than I've ever known And I think to myself What a wonderful world Yeah Do you believe in the wonderful world? Oh, yeah. Better for Clock Sack Band. 
So once again, I want to remind you that if you have joined us on TV, it's Clock TV, and you are watching the Sit uh, Nathan Anakwao annual lecture happening here at um, the Anakwao uh, Auditorium here at Klosak. At this time, I'm going to invite um, Beatrice Bampo Ado to join me here uh, to help introduce the guest speaker for today's lecture. So a round of applause for Beatrice Bampo Ado. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to introduce a legal luminary of a mass teacher and a beacon of justice, the distinguished Justice Victor Mawulom Duche. With a career span of five decades and a profound impact on the legal landscape of Ghana and beyond, Justice Doche's legacy is one of unwavering dedication to the principles of justice, fairness, and the rule of law. Born on 8th June 1953 in Pando in the Volta region, Justice Doche's journey through academia and law began at Pando Secondary School and continued at Accra Academy. Yeah. He continued his legal studies at the University of Ghana, Lagon, and was called to the bar in November 1978. His career took flight at the Attorney General's Department before venturing into private practice, where he established Mawulom Chambers in the Volta region. Who, over the years, Justice Doche ascended the judicial ranks seven as a high court judge, a judge in the court of appeal, and ultimately as a justice of the Supreme Court of Ghana and the Gambia. His expertise in law and unwavering commitment to justice were underscored during his tenure as an acting chief justice, stepping into the role with grace and dedication upon retirement of Chief Justice Kwesi Enim Yeboa. Throughout his extensive career, Justice Duce exemplified a strong stance against corruption and abuse of public office, leaving an indelible mark in landmark cases that resonated with the core values of justice. His influence extended beyond the courtroom, shaping legal education and governance as chairman of esteemed academic institutions and governing bodies. As we gather for the Sid Nathan Anankwa Lecture and Awards, Justice Duche's presence serves as a testament to a lifetime dedicated to upholding the law, fostering fairness, and inspiring generations of legal practitioners to pursue justice relentlessly. Please join me in welcoming Justice Victor Maulom Duche, a paragon of justice, as he graces this esteemed event with his profound insight and wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give the honor with a resounding applause. Welcome into our midst, Justice Victor Maulom Duche. Please sit down. Thank you, Beatrice, for the kind words said about me. I think today is a very important day because Mr. Anand Kwao is a distinguished, was a distinguished civil servant and an old boy of Accra Academy. So I'm an old boy of Accra Academy and I used to admire him because during our days in Accra Academy, we had a tradition. Every two weeks, they will bring a distinguished past student to come and talk to us every two weeks, fortnightly. And I met him. I met the late Peter Ajete. I met the late VCRC Crab, the late Chief Justice Samuel Azu Crab, the late Chief Justice FK Apalu, the first neurosurgeon Mustafa and so on and so on. So 
I believe that going to a good school is very important. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I'm very happy that your executive secretary, your hard working executive secretary, is also a new boy of our school. I stand on the existing protocols, but I want to recognize the Deputy, Honorable Deputy Minister for Labor Relations, Honorable Bright Wereku Brobe, who is my very good friend. I see Dr. Yaoba here. <laughs> I see Dr. Yaoba here. And today the headline is, is attributed to him, Scrap Article 71. And uh, I'll be mentioning something about it in my speech. And my senior brother is here, Mr. Mawena Doche. Uh, he was, uh... So with this, let me start my presentation with a small quotation. Let me take this opportunity to thank the entire national executive of the Civil and Local Government Staff Association, CLOCSAC, led by their hardworking executive secretary, Azik Bampo Ado, for considering me worthy enough to be invited to deliver this year's Nathan and Akwao Excellence Awards Lecture Series. I'm very grateful. Permit me to start this distinguished lecture series today with a quote from pages 23 to 24 of Together is Better. It's a little book of inspiration by Simon Sinek, which I read regularly. Pick one of these. It's all fine and good to imagine what life would be like somewhere else. It takes some courage to live and go somewhere new, to head out to the great unknown. But what happens? If upon taking the first step, something goes wrong. Maybe it was a bad idea to live in the first place. Maybe it's best to turn back and stay put. After all, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Or maybe if you have the right people with you, they will give you the courage to keep going. It doesn't matter when we start. It doesn't matter where we start. All that matters is that we must start." Unquote. Indeed, the most important thing is that we all must decide to start something and take that bold first step. It was indeed such a bold decision to institute the Political Neutrality Project following the Supreme Court decision on 14th June 2017 in case number J1162016, entitled Civil and Local Government Staff Association of Ghana, Clocksack Plaintiff versus the Attorney General, Office of Head of Civil Service, Office of Head of Local Government Service, Ministry Sakra, who are the defendants, that had crystallized into this Nathan and Akwao Excellence Awards Lecture Series on key values and principles of neutrality such as leadership, integrity, loyalty, and selflessness in the civil and local government services. The theme for this year's rendition, as had been indicated supra, is constitutionality of the Presidential Office Act 1993, Act 463. In order to understand, appreciate, and apply the principles of law enunciated in the decision I have just referred to vis-a-vis -vis the Presidential Office Act, Act 463, and discuss whether the said act is constitutional or unconstitutional, it is important to set out the facts in the Cluxa case in some detail, the analysis by the court, and the core reasoned decisions of that court. It is only after such an analysis that we may be in a position to discuss whether the Presidential Office Act 1993 Act 463 is constitutional or not. 
It must, however, be noted that under Articles 2.1a and b and 131a and b of the Constitution 1992, it is only the Supreme Court that can declare an act of Parliament as unconstitutional. So I may only give you hints, but can, I cannot, as I stand here, declare any act unconstitutional because I don't have that power again as a retired judge of the Supreme Court. The plaintiff clock sack. What are the facts? The plaintiff clock sack is a registered trade union and mouthpiece of workers in the civil and local government services. The attorney general is the principal legal advisor to the government. In the third case, the court held that since the attorney general is the pro forma in defendant for all civil proceedings instituted against the state, the presence of the second and third defendants, i.e. Office of Head of Civil Service and Office of Head of Local Government Service in the suit was not necessary and accordingly struck them out as unnecessary parties. The crux of the plaintiff's course of action was based on a letter dated 19th October 2015 from the Head of Civil Service and addressed to all chief directors and all heads of departments in which the addresses were requested to remind all staff members that persons holding civil service positions are barred from participating in political activities, including the following. Note them clearly. A, attending political rallies. These days we see many of you attending such functions. Wearing party paraphernalia. Very soon next year, we'll be seeing most of you wearing party colors and paraphernalia. Subjecting oneself for party vetting. Holding party membership card. Standing for party primaries, etc. References were made in the said letter to the provisions of the Civil Service Code of Conduct, sections 12, 1, B, C, and E thereof, which were first issued on 1st November 1999. Out of abundance of caution, I wish to set them out quickly. 12.1. The Constitution of Ghana confers rights on all citizens of Ghana, including civil servants, to join any political party or association of their choice. However, by virtue of the traditional role of the civil service to serve the government of the day loyally and to maintain the confidence of any future administration, a civil servant may not. Please note the preamble. It says the needful that you have your rights. But because of your functions in your offices, you may not accept any office, paid or unpaid, permanent or temporary in any political party or organization. B, declare himself openly as a registered member of a political party or association. C, indicate publicly his support for any party, candidate, or policy. D, make speeches or join in demonstrations in favor of any political person, party, or propaganda. E, engage in activities which are likely to involve him in political controversy. Then two, notwithstanding, a civil servant is entitled to his views in political matters, and if so, qualified, may vote at elections. So you see that the Constitution has recognized your rights. At the same time, it takes into consideration the core functions you perform, thereby limiting your engagement in active party activities. The said letter under reference also advised that any civil servant who wished to participate in any political party activity should resign from the service and warn that they would deal with anyone who flouted the directive. It should also be noted that the Code of Conduct for Clockstart contains statements of principles of anonymity and permanence in the following terms. On anonymity, it says, quote, officers and staff of the local government service shall serve the state with neutrality and anonymity in the national and local government process. Permanence. The local government service is a constitutionally mandated public service institution and owes allegiance only to the state and community. 
The permanence of the local government service is integral to the achievement of the objectives of the local government authorities. Let me pause here and ask a simple question. In this dangerous political environment in which we all are in Ghana, assuming we have given the civil and local government staff the right to join parties or form parties, how will public service administration in Ghana be? This is food for thought. Based on the above two principles, the Code of Conduct sets out in Canon 1 a set of minimum standards of conduct which are to be adhered to by officers and staff of the local government service, quote, in the discharge of their roles or functions in any project or task. The most pertinent for our purposes being those set out in sub one, 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 five, one, six, and one, seven as follows. One, one, not put themselves in a position where personal interest conflicts or is likely to conflict with the performance of the functions of their office. Canon 1.5, never to act as an agent of or for the interests of a political, social, ethnic, gender, or interest group. 1.6, not to seek election to office as a member of an assembly. 1.7, not to attend or support the functions, programs, and activities of political, social, ethnic, or gender interest group in a private capacity and name or in circumstances unrelated to the discharge of the projects and tasks of the local government service. The plaintiff, that is Coxa, contended further that the heads of the civil service and local government service have in the past subjected members of Coxa to disciplinary proceedings for their engagement in political party activities. After citing a couple of examples, the plaintiff by a writ filed on 29th April 2016 on their behalf pursuant to Articles 2.1 and 131 of the Constitution invoked the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court claiming 15 reliefs. Out of abundance of caution and the sake of brevity, I will refer to relief 1, 2, and 9, and 10 only for this purpose. One reads, they were seeking a declaration that upon a true and proper interpretation of Article 12.2 and Article 21.3, Article 21A and D, Article 35B, D, Article 55, 1, 2, and 10, and Article 284 of the Constitution, 1992, a member of the civil service has a right to join any political party of his or her choice while still a member of the civil service. Two, a declaration that upon a true and proper interpretation of Article 12 to the same articles I mentioned earlier, a member of the civil service has a right to contest for election for political party office and to hold political party office while still a member of the civil service. Relief 9 reads, a declaration that upon a true and proper interpretation of the same articles a member of the local government service has a right to join any political party of his or her choice while still a member of the local government service. And then 10, a declaration that upon a true and proper interpretation of the same articles, a member of the local government service has a right to contest for elections for political party office and to hold political party office while still a member of the local government service, unquote. It might just be useful to quote in extenso the various constitutional provisions referred to supra as follows. I've set out the various constitutional provisions in the article which will be given out to you. But I want to read Article 284, which is the article that deals with conflict of interest. 284 reads, a public officer shall not put himself in a position where his personal interest conflicts or is likely to conflict with the performance of the functions of his office. This is a very useful constitutional provision, but it's more honored in the breach than its observance in Ghana. Arguments of plaintiffs in court. What were the arguments of Kolosak in court? 
In the Supreme Court, the plaintiff anchored his statement of case on the following two issues. Whether or not, on a true and proper interpretation of the Constitution, members of the civil service and local government service have a right to join political parties and hold executive positions in political parties. And two, whether or not, on a true and proper interpretation of the Constitution, members of the civil service and local government service have a right to contest local government elections while still members of their respective services. In respect of the first issue, the plaintiff made reference to the articles and argued that the effect of Article 12.2 of the Constitution is that the rights guaranteed by the provisions of Chapter 5 of the Constitution are enjoyable as of right by all persons subject only to the rights and freedoms of others and public interest. The plaintiff then referred to Section 12.1 of the Civil Service Code of Conduct, already referred to Supra, and noted that although the provisions of the code acknowledges the right of civil servants to join political parties, there is an attempt to limit the scope of the right to join political parties and even hold political views. The plaintiff then questioned the rationale of joining a group if one cannot openly display membership, ideals, philosophies, and views of that group, unquote. After referring to Article 21.3 Supra, the plaintiff asserted that although this might appear to permit limitation on the scope of Article 12.2 because of the expression, quote, are consistent with this constitution, unquote, any limitation must not only be necessary for a free and democratic society, but must also be in sync with the letter and spirit of the Constitution, and that in any case, Article 55 does not contain any such apparent limitation as in Article 21.3. The plaintiff furthermore referred to the case of Kwajoga Adra versus National Democratic Congress and reported decision of the Supreme Court dated 25th July 2015. Based on the above, the plaintiff emphasized that the freedom of association, which is among the fundamental freedoms enshrined in Article 21 of the Constitution, entails the freedom to manifest and express membership of an association to which a person belongs, and that, therefore, the right to join a political party necessarily carries with it the right to manifest such affiliation, just as in the case of freedom of assembly, expression, and conscience whereas Section 12 of the Civil Service Code of Conduct attempts to limit the scope of the right to join political parties. After referring to a number of foreign cases, the plaintiff concluded its arguments as follows. That the question of neutrality, which is the reason for the bar against civil and local government employees, is untenable, only, as only a minute fraction of the civil and local government services perform tax that may require their political impartiality. And thus, a general ban on active political activity is a fetter on the constitutional right of association of political activism. Even though the plaintiff recognized the need for political neutrality in its activities in the civil service, it reckoned that this need is adequately addressed by the constitution See Article 284, which I refer to on conflict of interest, and other documents such as the obligation stated in Clause 37 of the Code of Conduct to maintain confidentiality, Section 87 of the Civil Service Act 1993, PNDC Law 327, which debars a civil servant from placing himself in a conflict of interest or potentially conflict of interest positions with the performance of his office, among others such as Section 91 of PNDC Law 327, which mandates civil servants to, upon recruitment, take the prescribed oath of allegiance, secrecy, and official oaths. The plaintiff then reiterated their views and reinforced them by stating that the right to join parties and participate in their activities, the taking part in active party activities necessarily includes the right to hold executive positions in such political parties. The plaintiff on further reception of arguments in support of issue two supra ingeniously tried to draw a distinction 
between the eligibility criteria in Article 94.1 and 2 of the Constitution and Article 55.8, which proscribe persons not qualified to be elected as members of parliament from being a founding member, leader, a member or executive of a, of a political party in Article 94.3a, b, and c of the Constitution. I set this out clearly, but I want to read Article 94.3b, which is that a person shall not be eligible to a member of parliament if he is a member of the police service, the prison service, the armed forces, the judicial service, the legal service, the civil service, the audit service, the parliamentary service, the statistical service, the fire service, the customs, exercise, and preventive service, the immigration service, or the internal revenue service, or is a chief. The argument made finally by the plaintiff will be reduced to as follows. That since Articles 94, 1, and 2, which constitutes the criteria for those eligible to be elected as members of parliament, does not include civil and local government staff, but rather Article 94, 3, which lists those excluded from eligibility. The plaintiff curiously concludes that the staff of the plaintiff qualify to be active and or executive members of political parties, save for their being eligible to be elected as members of parliament. To this end, the plaintiff referred to Article 35, 6D of the Constitution, and which reads as follows. Towards the achievement of the objective stated in Clause 5 of this article, the state shall take appropriate measures to make democracy a reality by decentralizing the administrative and financial machinery of government to the regions and districts, and by affording all possible opportunities to the people to participate in decision making at every level in national life and in government. And the plaintiff concluded that a member of the civil or local government is entitled to take part in political party primaries with a view to being elected into parliament or local government. The brief but incisive submissions of the defendant in court was anchored forcefully on Articles 21.3, 94.3, which I have referred to, and 2.8.4 of the Constitution. According to the defendant, the combined effects of the above provisions of the Constitution, all of which have been referred to, has worked to oust the members of the civil and local government service from participating in political activities. This is because the role of the civil servant is that he or she must at all times maintain neutrality in political matters in order to ensure their impartiality and gain confidence in the performance of their work. The defendant finally submitted that the code of conduct for the Ghana civil service admits of the rights of all to participate in political activities as contained in section 12.1 of the civil service code I've already referred to. The defendants concluded their arguments on the fact that the restrictions placed on civil servants in relation to political party activities are designed to ensure that the actions of the civil servant do not give rise to a perception of bias or influence from political party motives, unquote. How did the Supreme Court decide this Cloxa case? After analyzing the various arguments and positions raised by learned counsel in the Supreme Court, Sofia Kufo JSC, as she then was, speaking with one voice on behalf of the court, reasoned and held as follows. Famously noted, every constitution has its letter, that is what the, the, the constitution states, as well as its spirit, which is gleaned from the intention of the framers of the constitution. Clearly, if the framers of the constitution had intended the enjoyment of the fundamental human rights and freedoms to be absolute, they would have expressly stated same. Granting limitation on the exercise of these rights is a clear indication that the framers of the constitution must have contemplated certain overriding interests i.e. the public interest in respect of the exercise of these rights, as well as the public interest in the assurance that public officers will as much as possible serve the public rather than political interest, unquote. 
The Supreme Court explained the position of the court further in the following elegant and precise language after referring to sections two and three of the Civil Service Act as follows. It is clear from the foregoing functions that a large measure of apparent political anonymity or neutrality is required in order for the civil service to function satisfactorily and effectively as part of national government machinery. To be effective, the work of a civil servant in Ghana, no matter the level of operation, requires some expectation of efficiency, discretion, loyalty, and public trust. At this stage of our social political development, when political discourse is all pervasive, and rivalry can easily trigger a whole range of reactions. Note that this was in 2016 and even not 2023. Including even violence, it would be most unhealthy to countenance civil and local government servants who publicly proclaim their partisan leanings in the public space. Whilst this membership of a a party is their right. The open manifestation of such leanings cannot augur well for a neutral workplace and demonstrable assurance of transparency and anonymity stroke neutrality in decision making or execution of functions. Otherwise, a public perception of political corruption in all its forms, including bias, nepotism, abuse of position, opacity and lack of accountability will be engendered, thereby weakening the effectiveness of these government services to the detriment of the nation as a whole." Unquote. Rationalizing the basis of the unanimous decision, the learned judge stated as follows. It is therefore our view that the code of conduct of the civil service and the local government service in general do not deny civil and local government servants the freedom of association, particularly the right to join political parties of their choice. They merely seek to place a limitation on the manifestation of that right while in service in order to maintain the neutrality of the civil and local government service and foster the principles of anonymity and permanence. What they say in some is if you wish to broadcast or otherwise manifest your political party alliance and or run political office, step away from the said services." Unquote. Concluding this unanimous decision, the court referred to Articles 240, 2D, 2413, 245A and B, and also to the following functions of the Local Government Act 2016, Act 936, Sessions 12, 1, 2, 3, A, B, and C, D, E, up to uh, the, all those things that I've mentioned there. The court then concluded their judgment in this lucid language as follows. On a true and proper interpretation of the Constitution, a member of the Clocksack has a right to join any political party of his or her choice. However, such a person does not have the right to participate overtly in political party activities while still a member of the civil or local government service. Two, on a true and proper interpretation of the Constitution, a member of the Clocksack does not have a right to contest for elections for political party office or hold political party office while still a member of the civil or local government service. Three. On a true and proper interpretation of the Constitution, a Clocksack member does not have the right to remain a member of the civil service or local government service after his or her nomination by a political party or otherwise to contest for election as a member of parliament. Moreover, such a person shall resign from his or her office immediately his or her political activities become overt. And finally, the provisions of the Code of Conduct for members, for members of Clocksack. The provisions of the Code of Conduct for members of the civil service or local government service enacted by the councils of civil service or local government service 
and any other authority barring a member of the civil service or local government service from engaging in political party activities are not in contravention of the Constitution and are therefore not unconstitutional. The above constitute the reasoning of the court. What should be noted in this decision is that the court has elevated to a very high pedestal the core principles of neutrality, impartiality, integrity, and permanence that the civil and local government services have as their core values by which they perform their functions as well as the yardstick by which they are measured. That explains the rationale why even though political actors come and go, the civil and local government staff remain in office permanently until their compulsory retirement times are due unless removed from office for stated misbehavior. There is therefore the fact that acceptance of employment in the civil and local services as involves acceptance of these restraints which have been in practice for good reason. It is therefore in the above context that we, I will discuss the constitutionality or otherwise of the Presidential Office Act. So the, the above is just the groundwork for the main discussion of the Presidential Office Act. The Presidential Office Act 1993, Act 463, came into force on 22nd December 1993. The long title of the act reads as follows, quote, an act to establish the presidential office to provide for staff for the president and vice president to provide for their functions and for related purposes. Section 2 states that the functions of the office as providing the president and vice president such services as they may require for the efficient and effective implementation of the executive functions of the president and vice president under the constitution and any other law. Section 3, which deals with members of the office, has the following provisions. 3.1. The presidential office shall be made up of persons appointed as presidential staff under this act, one of whom shall be appointed as head of the office and be such other public officers as may be seconded or transferred to the office. Sub clause two, subject to section two, members of the office shall be assigned such duties as the president may determine. This Presidential Office Act law came into force in 1993. And if you recall, the first parliament of the Fourth Republic was boycotted by the major opposition party at the time. Because for the first time in our history, we held only the presidential election on the first day, in 7th of December, to, uh, 1992, and then subsequently, because of allegations concerning the votes at the time, the party decided to boycott the elections. So it was an overwhelming majority parliament of the NDC at the time. I think it was only National Convention Party which had few members in parliament at that time. And also the designation of the persons, meaning the president can appoint people directly, but some others can be seconded or transferred to the office, I believe from the civil service or local government service. Section four deals with appointments under the office and it provides as follows. The president shall, acting in consultation with the Council of State, appoint such persons as he considers necessary to hold office as presidential staff in the office. The number of persons that may be appointed under subsection one of this session and the grade of the officers shall be determined by the president. This is a blanket law which gives the president as extreme lazity to do whatever he likes with the office. And you can imagine the scenario in 1993 
those of you who are a bit old can imagine, do, actually know what happened in 1993. Some cannot understand. Then section 4.2, the number of persons that may be... So a lot of power has been put in the hands of the president. And one may ask that why, since 1993, various presidents have come and gone. But they all continue to operate under the same law. None has questioned removal or resignation from office or on cessation of the tenure of the office. Then the big one is section six, other conditions of office. Presidential staff shall be entitled to such salaries, allowances, facilities, and privileges as shall be determined under Article 71 of the Constitution. Now, as I said in my preamble, I read this morning that the Secretary General of the TUC, who is here, has asked for the scrapping of Article 71, which affects me also. <laughs> but that does not mean to say we cannot discuss the issues. Section 8 deals with qualification of presidential staff. The provisions are the normal qualifications and disqualifications that persons who are eligible to be employed in the public service are subject to. Section 9 deals with the application of the Code of Conduct in Articles 284, that's the conflict of interest, to 288. Articles 284 to 288, I set them out in the paper so that you don't have to go looking for the Constitution to read before you understand. So I'll just go straight away to page 23 of my paper, which in this act, interpretation is that in this act, unless the contest otherwise requires, office means office of the president and vice president. Presidential staff means persons appointed under section 41 of this act, i.e. the persons appointed by the president acting in consultation with the Council of State as referred to. Now, what is the constitutionality of this law? Does the fact that Act 463 was passed in 1993 mean anything? Well, what it does mean is that it was passed by a one-sided parliament. But as I have indicated, I'm surprised that since, 19, since 2001, when we changed governments, no president since then has questioned the constitutionality or otherwise of this act. So bear that in mind. The fact that it was passed by a one-sided parliament does not take anything from the legitimacy and efficacy of Act 463. Highlights of Act 463. Under this act, the president has the power to appoint persons as presidential staff under the law one of whom shall be named as head of the office, that's the chief of staff. Secondly, the president can also cause seven public officers to be seconded or transferred to the office of the president. The criteria for such secondment or transfer is not stated in the act. So how does the president do that? In making the appointments under section 31A of Act 463, the president shall act in consultation with the Council of State. Those are the fresh appointments he's making. Four, there is no limit to the number of persons that the president may appoint to the office, and the grace the officers occupy shall be determined by the president. So there's no limit at all to the, the number of persons. Now, staff of the presidential office hold office at the pleasure of the president and shall cease to hold office when the president also leaves office. This will seem to apply only to those appointed by the president and not seconded or transferred from the other public services to the office. This may go back to the offices or be retained when the new president lies. 
The salaries, allowances, facilities, and privileges of the staff of the office shall be determined under Article 71 of the Constitution. The president is all of the other public services and Article 71 office holders. Now, let's, who, is a pub, who is an Article 71 office holder? For an understanding, we have to go through the Constitution. Article 71 states, the salaries and allowances payable and the facilities and privileges available to the speaker, the deputy speakers and members of parliament, the chief justice and other justices of the Superior Court of Judicature, the auditor general, the chairman and deputy chairman of the electoral commission, the commissioner for human rights, administrative justice and his deputies, and the district assembly's common fund administrator, the chairman, vice chairman and other members of a National Council for Higher Education, how so described. describe. Now I understand it's called GTEC, Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, the Public Services Commission, the National Media Commission, Lands Commission, the National Commission for Civic Education, being expenditure charged on the consolidated funds shall be determined by the president on the recommendations of a committee of not more than five persons appointed by the president acting in accordance with the advice of the Council of State. The salaries and allowances payable and the facilities available to the president, the vice president, the chairman, and other members of the Council of State, ministers of state, and deputy ministers, being expenditure charged on the consolidated fund, shall be determined by parliament on the recommendations of the committee referred to in clause one of this article. For the purposes of this article, and except as otherwise provided in the Constitution, salaries include allowances, facilities, and privileges, and retiring benefits or awards. Now, if we refer to Article 291F of the Constitution, 1992, it states clearly as follows. 291, this article applies to the amendment of the following provisions of this Constitution which are in this constitution referred to as entrenched provisions. Now, we have two methods of amending our constitution. One, you can go to parliament and raise a, 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 an act of parliament to amend portions of the constitution. Recently, one was done in the case of the death penalty. Now, there are some provisions which are entrenched, and the procedure for amending entrenched provisions is very, very difficult. And if you read the report of the constitutional provisions, that, that's the experts who prepared the constitution, we took lessons from our the First Republic, where the first president amended the constitution severally and arrogated to himself the power to even dismiss chief justices and Supreme Court judges and so on and so forth. So we were guided by history to entrench the constitutional provisions such that no despot can come and toy with our human rights. So if you go, you see that human rights provisions are entrenched. Provisions on Article 71 are entrenched. So Article 290, this article applies to the amendment <coughs> of the following provisions of this constitution, which are in the constitution referred to as entrenched provisions. And you see that Article 